The Founding of the Zygon Empire by archivist Mihail Donata of the Arcane Metropolis of Maracasa. The Zygon Empire is, today, one of Naris's great powers, with sovereignty stretching from Rhodes End in the southeast of Oldenhir to the pass at Kalasar on Astalon. The human-dominated empire commands respect and authority the world over. But how did such a thing come about? How did humanity rise from its station as a shackled plaything for its elven overlords to being the master of a world-spanning empire? As is so often the case, the answer lies in humble and unassuming beginnings. Founded in the late 8th century, the fate and destiny of the small town of Harbinger is inextricably tied to the fate and destiny of the Zygon Empire. Originally created as a subject of the Kakaran Empire, Harbinger was the first settlement created following the pilgrimage to Founder's Trail. For the first century or so of his existence, Harbinger was not but a passer's fancy, a mere stop on the road into the greater Greenwood. It wasn't until coal was discovered beneath the town that its true virtues were known. With this discovery, many industrialists flocked to the town, eager to plunder its natural riches. Harbinger expanded to accommodate and before long what was once a village of a few hundred, now housed well over 13,000 elves, and yet more with their slaves. With its expansion, Harbinger was now an attraction, not merely an afterthought, and its community came to be vibrant and bountiful. And for the lion's share of its existence, this was the long and short of the matter. It was but a relatively humble coal town, of yet humbler origin. The people contented themselves, and their slaves toiled restlessly in the mines. It wouldn't be until its end, however, that it would blossom into its truest form. As the 18th century dawned, the prospects for the town began to worsen. In 1709, the yield from the mine began to dwindle. This pattern carried itself over to 1710. While these losses were small at first, by 1716, the mines were down on production nearly 12%, a loss of about 2,000 gold per year. Though entrenched, many industrialist mine owners were spooked and sold off their holdings to smaller entrepreneurs. Gradually, as the years went on, older and smaller mines began to close. As they did, slaves, money, and people went with them, gone off in search of greener pastures. By 1780, all but 2,000 of the elves had gone from Harbinger. With their slaves, the total population was down to 3,800. The mines within the town were facing great losses, prompting one more investors to leave. This pattern of downturn culminated in 1783, with the aptly named Great Valenia Mine Collapse. On the morning of 17th Ember, 1783, a deep section of the Valenia family mine collapsed as two groups of slaves changed shifts. 65 slaves were killed, but more importantly for the elven owners, one of the last profitable sections of the mine was blocked behind several hundred feet of collapsed stone. Already failing to recoup losses, the mine's operators and investors opted to pull out instead of making further expenditures to clear the rubble. This marked the closure of the largest remaining mine in the town. With it, nearly 1,200 elves departed, hoping to escape the economic downturn, taking all but 700 slaves with them. Harbinger would more or less remain this way for most of the coming decade. The elven population gradually dwindled down as time passed before dropping below the human slave population in 1790. This, along with the greater trend of increasing human resistance to slavery, led the Kakaran governor for the Lesser Greenwood to station a company of soldiers in Harbinger in late Janir, 1791. Under the vile Major Arona, the soldiers took over the slave driving in the remaining mines. She and her subordinates were extraordinarily cruel to their helots, working them increasingly to the bone and forcing them to live in ever increasingly inhospitable conditions in a desperate attempt to break their spirits. This, however, would be both her undoing and the undoing of the Greater Kukaran Empire. As Merrill 1793 came to a close, the miners uncovered the new, as of yet untouched, vein of coal deep under the town. Emboldened by this news, Aurora sent word to the arcane metropolis of Maricaza, itself a blossoming academy town, hoping to draw investors to reinvigorate Harbinger. Though most investors in Maricaza were unimpressed with the finding, citing the closure of the other mines, two found the prospects of a new vein to be enticing. However, they were unimpressed by its yield. 
This news elated the glory hound of Orna, who immediately ordered her men to increase the yield of the mine by any means necessary. To this end, the soldiers began driving the slaves harder than ever before. Helots were forced to work increasingly torturous conditions, with even the pretense of a consideration for their safety tossed completely aside. Day in and day out, the humans were forced to dig deeper, to excavate more, and to haul even greater loads to meet quotas. Many slaves died of exhaustion, egged on by the malnutrition enforced as a part of a goal to crush their spirits. Others died to unsafe working conditions, with many already suffering from advanced stages of back lung and dust inhalation. Yet more were killed, not by their bodies, but by their masters, when they were executed for insubordination. In the span of a grueling month, the yield from the new vein had skyrocketed to well over 300% of its initial showing. In the process, though, 180 helots had perished. Each day instilled in the helot heart, there a growing sorrow and a desire to escape bondage. Each man, woman, and even child forced to work offered the prayer that they might be freed. And as fate would have it, their prayers were heard. One night, as a shift of slaves were leaving the mine, their clothes as black as the sky with the dust of coal, they looked upward and saw a cascade of heavenly lights, each shining brightly as they streaked over the wide starry expanse. One man, standing mesmerized with both his compatriots and the elves that named themselves his masters, was Benjamin Zygon. He was entranced by the sight. It was as bright as day and as vibrant as a rainbow. Here, with such a glorious sight to behold, he issued a small prayer. Though he hoped from the bottom of his heart that whatever grand force that could allow such a beauty to exist would might make right the ugliness to which he and his fellow humans had been condemned. There was a resignation that even he could hear in his voice as he whispered to himself. However, his voice was heard. In defiance of all expectations of reality, the brightest comet there turned in the sky and began screaming its way toward him. As he stood believing he was watching his blessed relief come, ironically, in death, the comet slowed as it drew near. With it was a distance of about thirty paces from him. It stopped and unfurled its true form. Ostruck, the assembled watched as it took the form of a woman. Standing nearly fifteen feet tall and dressed in a set of pearlescent plate mail armor. In her right hand, she carried the grand sword of pale form and gold filigree, nearly eighteen foot long, and from her back stretched grand golden wings. She was want of a helmet, and her beautiful blonde hair flowed out behind her, as though it were suspended in water. Her face of a fair complexion, she peered at the young Benjamin with eyes that shone of a bright gold. And to him she spoke. I am Vogan. Her voice was multitonal, as though many spoke as one. Where others cowered before the sound, Benjamin was overcome with a great feeling of assurance. He stood tall, meeting the divine Vulgan's gaze with his own. I have heard thy prayer, my child. Now I have accepted thy plight as my own. I grant unto thee the sword to break thy shackles and unto thy blood and thy progeny, the shield stayest them from bondage forevermore. Outstretching her hand, motes like threads of pure light enveloped Benjamin, and but a moment he was totally metamorphosed. His body, which was before filled with weary and fatigue, was granted newfound life and vigor. Unto him was conferred a great strength. As he stood now, he dwarfed those around him, where before he was five foot nine inches in height, now he towered a mighty eight foot six inches. Now enraptured by her presence, Saint Zygon bent his head in deference. As he did, she approached and spoke. Prithee, raise thy head. I do not freest thou from thine abasement, nor thy master forced thou to abase thyself, nor choose me as thy master now. Her voice now soothing and full of assurance, as he raised his head, she offered to him the sword she held, whose formless blade had shortened to but six foot in length. Thy plight is not yet at its end. I shall as grant thee this nameless blade as thine instrument. 
He took the blade into his hand and spoke. Nameless? And she responded. The instrument is thine. It is thine and thine alone to name. He looked upon the pale blade and spoke again. The first light, that shall be its name. He looked back to the Volgan, who was now surrounded by twelve armored angelic beings, and she spoke once more. Then I confer unto you, Chainbreaker, thy first light. Go forth and freest all thy kin from thy bondage, and stop us not until all thy kind knowest freedom. She then departed with her entourage and streaked back across the sky away from the forest, burning like a fire as they went. Standing there with newfound strength and a blade of fated make and origin, he looked first to the other helots. Each of them was dumbfounded, scantily able to believe what they had just witnessed. He then looked to the elves who guarded the entrance of the mine. Each of them was similarly awestruck at what they had just seen. He stood there for a moment, contemplating how to proceed. By now the commotion had brought other soldiers, both from within and without the mine. Though they were uncertain what had happened, they shared none of the dumbfounding that they who had witnessed it had. All they saw was a loud flash and an armed slave. They brandished their spears and their swords and demanded that the newly sainted Benjamin Zygon lay down his weapon. As one particularly bold elf approached to apprehend him, Benjamin raised first light and cut her down where she stood. The blade rent cleanly through her chest and she fell without another word. Horrified, the remaining elves recoiled. Then he spoke. I give you the opportunity to lay down your arms. I shall spare you. I give you this opportunity that your kind has never given mine. And so, the battle for Harbinger began. Rallying the helots and promising them freedom, they took up arms and slew the soldiers of the town. As dawn broke the following day, the now stained Zygon gathered all the remaining elves, the civilians and those who had surrendered to him, into the center of town. Here he spoke to them broadly. I am Benjamin Zygon, Chainbreaker, and I have freed the humans of Harbinger by force. Henceforth, this day shall be known as the first stand in commemoration of our struggle. I shall not harm you, for you are not the ones who keep my people in bonds any longer, and I shall absolve you of your sins committed against my people. But I must send you from Harbinger. If you remain here, your empire will believe you complicit in our struggle. They will not believe tales of divine intervention, and they will slay you for your betrayal. In both the interest of our freedom and yours as well, I must cast you out. But I implore you, go spread the word of our deeds here, that my people might walk as free as I allow you to now. Stories of the night of the first light and the battle of first end spread like wildfire in the coming weeks, and soon, helots from all olden here were standing up against their masters. Tales of the heroism of Saint Benjamin Zygon filled the hearts of the humans with a great fervor and tales of divine blessing for those in the struggle for freedom brought a measurable joy to all who heard. Such was the beginning of the human revolt, a long protracted and bloody conflict that sought the end of human chattel slavery. Though Saint Benjamin would not live to see his revolution through to fruition, it was not until 1955 KC that human slavery would be outlawed in olden here, as to appease the armies of the human uprising. With their goal achieved in a capacity, the now aimless humans looked to the family Zygon for guidance. Two years later, the Zygon Empire was formed under Kataro I, Zygon of House Luna, who was granted the title Chainbreaker after the Vulcan's words to Saint Zygon. In the modern day, Her Grace Chainbreaker Mercy I, Zygon of House Lumi, rules the Empire. From her position on the Throne of Light, she rules harshly but fairly overseeing her lineage's duties and carrying her proof of birthright, the first light. Often seen with hair in a pinned bun and adorned in a red dress with filigreed gold and carrying the light at her hip, her serious demeanor is felt by all in her presence. Her dark golden eyes are harsh and studied in a way that only a veteran monarch's could be. She and her court rule the empire as befits her station, 
She delegates control of land and cities to the various now noble families that helped her greatest predecessor during his struggle for freedom. She demands far more from her nobility than she does her laity. She has been known to rip up entire houses by their roots at even the slightest hint of corruption in her court. The Chainbreaker, along with her court, are considered the primary power in Olden here and Astalon. And that is no surprise. She and the divine power granted to the entire Zygon line are not to be taken on lightly. From this humble archivist's first-hand encounter of her grace, her presence contains a certain pressure, not unlike the gaze of a dragon. The Empire is well guarded in her hands, 